Welcome to Are You Real Linked? A journey together toward a deeper, more authentic connection with God and with others. Through teachings of prayer and faith, our common stories of business, relationships, and personal growth will give you the direction you need to truly feel linked with the lost, hopeless, and hurting to help restore your community. Now please welcome your host, Christy Austin. Hello, and welcome to Are You Real Linked? With your host, Christy Austin, where we are connecting to deeper faith. I am so excited to be with you here today, and I have a special guest. We're going to do an interview today and really dissect what it means to be a city taker and what it means out of Luke 10. We've been looking at Luke 10 for some time and what it really means to go in 2018. Of course, I want to remind you that you can catch John Fuller every Wednesday on Are You Real? Feel free to join him on Facebook, Spotify, Instagram, and wherever you download your podcasts, iTunes. And you can keep up with all our new hosts on Are You Real? Look for us at areyoureal.org. And today I am so excited to introduce you to a guest Her name is Naomi Volkman, and she is the Outreach Director at City Light Church. And the reason I'm so excited for you to hear her story is because she is actively not only a city taker herself, but she's leading others into city taking. And let me remind you what a city taker is. A city taker is taking back the city through the art of giving. And when we talk about the art of giving, of course, we're talking about the art of giving away love. Freely you've received, not freely give. And so hello to you, Naomi. How are you today? I'm doing very well. Thank you so much for having me on with you today. Oh my goodness. We are so excited to hear your heart. I cannot wait for the listeners to hear some of the divine strategies that God has given you. In what city are you located in? I am located in Toledo, Ohio. Awesome. Awesome. Well, as many people know, Toledo, Ohio is my hometown where I was born and raised. And so Of course, this is very near and dear to my heart just to see what God is doing in that city uh, really just thrills me. And so, Naomi, can you tell me what ministry you're with and how God called you to do this? Absolutely. I work with City Light Church in Toledo. And we partner together with multiple churches in the area to do outreaches. And um, I actually gave my life to Jesus 12 years ago, and um, I encountered the, the current pastors of City Light Church through an outreach that they were doing, where they would just come down to this fountain where me and my friends would hang out on Friday nights, and they would just love us. They would bring us sandwiches and peanut butter and listen to uh, just peanut butter cookies and all kinds of goodies and just listen to our life stories. And we were kind of the gothic metalhead kids. And, um, eventually they just started telling us like, God loves you and he has a plan for your life. And, um, I ended up having, um, an encounter where I had a vision and I encountered Jesus and he just showed me how much he loved me. And I just gave my life to him in that time. And I never looked back. And from that point on was when I started doing outreach in my neighborhood and at my, at that time, high school. Oh my goodness. That's awesome. Okay. So, so you, you describe a fountain, which I I do want to share with our listeners, the pastor and wife that she's referring to were here on the show a couple months ago, and they did an interview called city taking 101. And you can catch them. That's pastor George and Sarah Williams. That was an incredible interview. One that I just loved and uh, it was amazing to hear their heart and just even the the one thing that stuck out to me was I did that interview 
of you live and our listeners couldn't see them, but as they would talk about their city, their eyes would well up with tears. And so to, to see that was so amazing. So I encourage you to go back and listen to that. But what I'm hearing, and I just, I would love to get more information. So you're down by a, a, a big fountain, I assume like a water fountain or something like that, where just a common place where people hang out or was it just somewhere y'all went or how, how did that work? So there is a, um, I guess, science museum, science exploring place in downtown Toledo. It's called COSI, or now it's called the Imagination Station. Outside of there, they probably have a 10-foot in diameter, just fountain, just public area. Um, and it's right by the, the Mommy River. And every Friday night, um, after school or after work, when I was a teenager, there would be a large group of kind of gothic, metalhead teenagers and young adults that would just hang out there every Friday night. And we had kind of our own little community and family. And it was something that had been going on for maybe 10, 15 years that I joined up with when I was a teenager. So George and Sarah, one day they were walking by and um, they saw us and, you know, they saw our group of, you know, 40 or so young people. And as they went home, they were praying and they felt led to come back and just to share the love of God with us. So that's kind of how that connection started. Wow. And then did you have that vision immediately like down there at the fountain or was that something that came later? Later. Um, I just saw their, their joy and their eagerness to love people and serve people and serve God. And I never had experienced Christians who were passionate and in love with God. I only at that time in my life met Christians who served God out of duty or out of obligation. Mm. And um, I began to ask them questions like, you guys, you know, seem cool. You seem like normal young people who could do anything with your life. Why are you giving your life to God? And why do you pray? And why they would invite all of us to their, their large home. And I would say, why do you invite us here? And, you know, they would just tell me about the love of God and how passionate God is for people and how passionate God was for me. And so um, I had this time when I was sitting on uh, the front porch of their house um, George and Sarah's and I was talking to Sarah and I was just telling her my life story and I was crying and I was telling her about all of the good, the bad and the ugly. And she said, you know, I think you should just pray and ask God if he's real, if he would encounter you. And so I said, okay, I truly have nothing to lose. Like, you know, I already think God's not real, so nothing would change if nothing <laughs> happens. It's kind of my thought. Yeah. And at that time, yeah, totally. And at that time, I was going through a really hard situation in my life. Um, I was 15 years old, and my mom was di- was actually dying of cancer, and mm. I was helped taking care of her. And it was just a really painful, um, ugly, hard season in life. And I actually was struggling with suicidal thoughts and tendencies so hard that my thought was, if I can live to when my mom dies, then I'll kill myself. Like I just was in such a hard, hard, hard place. If you don't encounter me, and I gave him a date. I said, November 22nd. If you don't encounter me by November 22nd, I'm going to take my life. And that was just a few weeks before um, November 22nd. This was in the beginning of November, 2006. And so, um, I just prayed that in my heart. Nobody knew I prayed that I ended up going to church with, with a group of people, mainly because I was honestly using them from a ride to get from one place to another place, but God uses anything. (laughs) And, um, they're like, Hey, can we stop by the church real quick on our, on your way home? And I was like, sure, no problem. I was kind of, you know, at their mercy because they were giving me a ride. And I was in this worship service. And for the first time in my life that I knew of, I felt the presence of God just overcome my body. And I just felt just loved. And I just felt like God loves me right where I'm at. And regardless of everything I've done and all of my sins, like God just loves me. And um, I actually had a vision. I didn't know what a vision was. I didn't know God spoke to people today. I had no clue. And so 
And I had only, my biblical experience was I had read Genesis 1 and I had read Revelation 22. So I read the first chapter of the Bible and the last chapter of the Bible. And I just at that point was like, that's good enough for me. I'm sure I understand this. You know, maybe I'll get the cliff notes sometime with kind of my thought on God. And so um, I, I had this vision and I saw Jesus. And he was sitting in a throne with a lightning bolt in his hands and uh, fire in his eyes. And there were colors surrounding this throne, colors I had never seen on earth. And in my head I, and in my heart, I was like, Jesus is the son of God. I, there was this sea of glass in between us, very much like in, in Revelation 4. There's a sea of glass between us. And Jesus is just looking at me. And he has that lightning bolt in his hand. And I feel electricity coming out of the lightning bolt and penetrating my heart. Yeah. And I just ex- am experiencing the, just the radical, raw love of God for me. And uh, Jesus said, Naomi, you have no idea how much I love you. I'm going to spend the rest of your life showing you how much I love you. I had this, then I had this vision and I probably saw about 20 moments in my life. And in these moments, they were dark and painful in the most painful, awful moments of my life. And I saw that Jesus was there and I saw in some of the moments he was hugging me or some of the moments he was laughing and saying, you know, girl, it's going to be okay. Everything's okay. This is all going to work out. I came to my senses. I was no longer in the vision. And I thought, if God really is like that, I'm going to serve him. So I went on to share my vision um, with my mentors, um, George and Sarah, my current pastors now. And they were like, you have to read the Bible, like read Revelation 4. Like that sounds so much like John's description of the throne room of heaven. And so I read it and I was like, wow, that really yeah. was God. That really was Jesus. Like, and I just knew like God's real and all the other, you know, I had, ex- I had experimented in uh, like Wicca and Church of Satan stuff and just some pretty dark stuff. And I, at that point was like, none of that stuff matters. Jesus is it. Like it's all Jesus for me. So yeah. And that, yeah. And it was just, it was just all, you know, all in for me. So. Wow. That is so incredible. I, I love your story. That is amazing. Um, and so not only are, are you going out to take your city, but you're a direct recipient of someone who, you know, was called to go and that's um, so cool. Um, whatever happened with your mom? Um, so I, I got saved in November and November 2006. And during that time, you know, I would um, share with my, I have two siblings. I would share with them about Jesus. And there were times um, my, you know, my mom had stage four cancer was like, off, like on and off of like, you know, one day she's going to die. The next day she isn't kind of a thing. Like, you know, she's a little more stable and uh, we would pray and she would be like about to die and then she'd get more stable. And my, my siblings would watch this and they were like, whoa, this is crazy. And so, um, I began along with, um, another pastor in our city. Uh, we just began sharing the gospel with my mom and my mom, uh, received Jesus and, uh, began her journey with the Lord. And, um, she was able to see, you know, me get baptized and stuff. And then that April, five months after I got saved and she had gotten saved maybe in February. Um, she passed away. So. Wow. I'm sorry for your loss, but man, what a beautiful story to know that it's not goodbye forever, you know, and that had to be so reassuring. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I mean, as hard as it was, you know, you know, nothing, nothing can take away that, that, that was painful. However, I have such confidence that, that my mom, you know, is in heaven with Jesus, you know, for eternity. So, I mean, it's just, it's just amazing. And as hard as that season was, it was such just a beautiful season. There's nothing like seeing God encounter your family, you know? Oh my goodness. That's amazing. Love it. Love your story. So I'm going to kind of switch gears here, but you know, you really are living out the concept, you know, freely you've received now freely you you give. And so how, how are you taking your city? What does that look like for you? So for us, it looks, it looks like a lot of things. 
Um, first off, it looks like doing periodical trainings where we're, we're teaching people how to share the gospel, how to share their testimony, because everyone who said yes to Jesus has a testimony, whether it's like mine, you got radically saved and you were doing crazy things or whether God has been faithful to you all your life. And you're like, I think I was saved at four. Like that's a beautiful testimony of the faithfulness of God. So, you know, we train people just to share their testimony, to share it with confidence um, in their workplaces and on the streets, but also um, how to share the gospel, how to keep it simple, but share what Jesus did. And then we, I love to teach people how to pray for the sick and how to pray to see God invade situations. Because when you're at work or with your family or out in the community and you pray for somebody and they get healed, that is an immediate testimony that points to Jesus and the goodness of God and opens a door to share the gospel. And Jesus often, often walks in the, uh, the miraculous power of God and seeing people healed. And he told us we would do the same thing in greater works and, um, you know, getting words of knowledge and just uh, asking God and words of knowledge is asking God something about somebody that you wouldn't have known um, on your own. So maybe mm -hmm. God tells you that person has knee pain or that person has a headache or, you know, it could be something even like that person's from Florida, you know, it's, and then you ask them, is this true about you? And then God reveals himself in that situation. So we, we do trainings on how to do outreach. And then also monthly, we go out as a, as a collective group from our church and multiple churches in the area. We meet on Saturdays and we go out to different areas in our community, whether it's bus stops or parks or the mall. And we um, look for people to pray for. And in advance, we ask God for who we might run into that day. And so... That's amazing. So for somebody that has never done this before and, you know, they're in their city and they kind of feel like the Lord's calling them to go, what would be a good practical first step? Like, is there something that you'd suggest for them to begin with? Absolutely. Um, first off, I, if, if when I was talking about, you know, getting words of knowledge and praying for the sick and approaching strangers, a great reference or book that I would recommend is actually called The Treasure Hunt by Kevin Zedman. Mm. And it's about approaching people and um, getting words from God for people in your community. And it's a very simple book and anybody could do it. Anyone could pray for the sick. Anyone could lead someone to Jesus. And I love in Proverbs 28, one, it says the wicked run when no one is chasing them, but the godly are as bold as lions. And I don't believe that boldness is a personality trait or you're an extrovert. So you're bold. I believe you're bold because God gave you boldness. And so if you don't feel bold, ask, ask God to give you more boldness. And, um, Something I would encourage people to do, something simple, is just every day, just say, God, my life is yours. Who can I impact today? Who do you want me to stop for? You know, to say like, God, I'm going into the grocery store. If there's someone you want me to talk to, like show them to me. And sometimes you're just walking past them and you just feel like an impression on your heart. Like I need to talk to this person. And sometimes you might know why. And other times you don't know. So you just start talking to them. And so really evangelism isn't about going out once a month or once a week or every day. It's about giving your life to God and saying, God, I am available to talk to, to pray for whoever you put on my path. I love that. I love that quote. Evangelism isn't about going out once a week or once a month, but saying, here am I type thing. Whoever crosses my path. That's so good. What a great reminder. So how long have you been serving in this ministry? Are you talking about like evangelism or city light or evangelism. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. So for me, when I first got saved, I kind of was shocked. Like I read the new Testament in the first week of my salvation. And I was like, wow, God says that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. 
He says, we can do greater works than Jesus himself. He says, you know, um, we're his ambassadors. He says all these faith-filled statements about us, that it's Christ in us, the hope of glory. So I had this thought and I was like, why, if this is true, why have I very rarely seen Christians walk in the power of God? And why has nobody ever shared with me the good news? And I was heartbroken that I was a 15 year old teenager in a city of a greater city of over 500 thousand people and nobody had ever shared the gospel with me. I was just shocked. And so, um, I kind of had this thought like, well, if no one else is doing it, why can't a 15 year old, the weird looking girl share the gospel with people? And so, um, from pretty much three weeks in, I began, um, going through my neighborhood with, um, bags of Panera bread that was donated to a ministry that I was a part of. And I would just knock on doors and just say, Hey, I have muffins and cookies and bread for you. How can I pray for you? And, and just listen to people and hear their stories and pray for them. And I began to, in my own way as a 15 year old, um, start to pastor people in my neighborhood by going to their houses and sitting with them for a cup of tea and just praying for them. And um, me, and then I met some kids at my school who were also on fire for God. And we began to walk around the school during our seven minute breaks and pray for people and go to the nurse's office and pray for kids. And so that's how it started for me was just right from the beginning. I just was like, how come no one's ever told me I could that Christianity was like this and that I could do this too. So yeah, that's amazing. I love that. That's so good. Uh, what's the one thing you've learned from your own journey in ministry that you would say to encourage other city takers? Um, I would say like, you know, that, that Jesus wants to see our city one, that Jesus died for every single person, that God is so passionate about seeing our cities restored. And I think sometimes we feel like this, we, we, we're visionaries, some of us, and we have this like big vision, like, you know, at our church, our vision, and not only our church, there's so many churches in our city that have um, grabbed the hold of this vision. It's called 500,000. It's that everyone in our city life would be saved and transformed. And to me, I think sometimes we get so caught up in the big picture and, uh, which is great, like be a big picture person. But I think just to remind ourselves that more can be done in a moment of God's presence and of his grace than 10 years of like striving and trying Mm -hmm. that we need to stay. We need, we don't just need to be about ministry, or just about the doing, but about, you know, the person who is Jesus, who's the Holy Spirit, who's the Father. So just staying in His presence and staying in love and being in love with God before ministry, before church, before the vision, you know? That's so good. I I often think that, you know, strategy always comes from the secret place. That's the secret place is a walking strategy. And um, that's such a great reminder. I love that, that Jesus wants to see our cities one. So true. Can you share a story of someone? I'm curious, uh, maybe a favorite story of someone who's deeply, been deeply impacted by what you do? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we go all over our city and pray for all kinds of people. And we're just now after, you know, 10, 12 years of doing this, starting to have a lot of repeats, a lot of people who are like, you've prayed for me like four times, you know, and, um, (laughs) but, and that's, that's encouraging. And that's cool because I want the church to have a reputation, the the city church. I'm not just about my church. I'm about all of the churches just representing Jesus well in our community. And I want them to know us for not the people who stand outside with picket signs, but the people who love them and meet them and find them and get to where they are and love them. And so um, one of my favorite stories. I actually wasn't even there for this, but it's one of the testimonies um, that have happened. And um, there was this young man and um, he felt like he should go and pray for someone at a local pet store. And he was with another young guy and they meet this guy and um, they have these things. They're called treasure maps. 
And if you, you know, read that book earlier called The Treasure Hunt um, by Kevin Zedman, you'll understand a little more of what I mean. But basically a treasure map is when you pray before going out on outreach and you ask God, what does someone look like? What do they need prayer for? Where do you want us to go? Um, type of a thing. And so they were in the um, pet store and they felt like God said to go to the cat food aisle. And they had some descriptions of like what someone would be wearing. And they walked into the cat food aisle, these two young men and they men, and they see this guy who fits their description. And they talk to him and they pray for him. And um, he ends up, you know, over a season, like, well, in that moment, he gave, he uh, encountered God. And over a season, he gave his life back to God. And uh, it's super, he's super on fire for God. And um, he goes to our church now. But when he, this young man shares the story, he gets choked up and he always says, they found me in the cat food aisle. And, and he's just working, stocking the shelves at the pet store. And to me, it's just like, that's, what the gospel is, is like God finds you right where you live, right where you work, you know? And I just love, I just love that story. It's simple, but it's profound because God meets us right where we are. Yes. I love that. God found me in the cat food aisle. That's amazing. One of the things we've really highlighted these last couple months, you know, in the going, because there's so many people that need to see the love of God that probably will never go to a church. You know, I don't know in your own story, if you had gone to a church before or what your experience was, but no, no. Wow. That's so cool. And so I love like they, they found me at the fountain, you know, it's like, (laughs) yes, yes. And that's so representative of who Jesus is, you know, the woman at the well, he went out and found people. So what a beautiful thing. So tell me, what's your favorite piece of what you get to do? Um, I love seeing people get excited about the gospel. I love seeing people who didn't think they could go out into their community and didn't think they could represent Jesus, realize that they're God's ambassadors. That's probably one of my favorite things. But my deepest favorite thing is... Um, seeing Jesus get his reward and seeing people come to God and receive salvation. There's absolutely no greater feeling. And I love um, in first Corinthians nine sixteen in um, the living Bible, it, it says for just preaching the gospel, isn't any special credit to me. I couldn't keep from preaching it. If I wanted to, I would be utterly miserable. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Mm. And for me, there's kind of like this, it wasn't always like this, but once I began to go out and share the gospel and get over my fears of what people think and what if I don't know what to say and you know, how we get over that is stepping out and seeing like, Oh wow. When I open my mouth, God really does, you know, use me to speak. And God really is invested in these people so much that, you know, when I step out, he'll help me out. And, um, for me, it's just sharing the gospel and just seeing people realize what God is really like. There's, there's no, there's not, there's absolutely nothing greater you know, on the, in the world, like, you know, we have something that money can't buy and that's, that's the good news, you know? Yeah, that's so good. Absolutely. Now this, of course, this podcast is called, Are You Real? And so our challenge is always to keep it real. And so for you, what's been the most difficult aspect of what you do? To be honest, I think it's, it's carrying a big vision uh, for a city and for, for a nation. And, um, you know, we go out and we do our efforts and, you know, we, we meet people one-on-one and we pray one-on-one and, and we, I believe we touch and impact their lives, but sometimes, you know, people encounter God and they're not, they're not ready or they're not at a place in that moment where they have Jesus be their Lord and savior and their life is completely transformed. Like not every story is like, whoa, that's incredible. And you watch people go back into, you know, um, the depths of addiction and pain and despair. And you're like, man, Jesus is your answer. And I think it's the, the hardest part is the testimonies we're in the middle of, you know, 
um, yeah. is the life that haven't been transformed yet. Or, you know, the, you know, you go out and you, you go out and you pray for people and you see some people really get born again and get healed and, you know, deaf ears open up, tumors get healed. And then, you know, you have those people in your personal family who you're still waiting for, for them to receive, receive Jesus. And, you know, and they've seen your life and you're, you're just waiting and you're just praying and you're just in that place. So it's the testimonies we're in the middle of that I feel like are the things I really, I, um, you know, I, 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 I struggle with and constantly encourage myself to, to be encouraged in the Lord about, so. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so good. That's such an excellent perspective, you know, because there is no such thing as failure. You know, even if, if you pray over someone or present the gospel and they don't accept it, but it's just one of the seeds along the way. Right. And uh, absolutely. What a beautiful thing. I love that. The testimonies that we're in the middle of. That's so good. What do you feel like has been the key to accomplishing the mission and vision that that God has given you, you know, in ministry? You know, it's easy to burn out and all these different things because you're giving so much for you. What's been the key? Um, It sounds simple, but just staying plugged into God and um, staying plugged into the Holy Spirit and just realizing that, like, we in ministry, you have a lot of moments where you can feel like a failure. Like, you have a lot of moments where you're like, ooh, that didn't go out as planned. And just always going back to Jesus and saying, Jesus, what did you think about what just happened? 99 times out of 100, God's perspective about me is a lot different than my perspective about me and God's perspective of my failure. My, what I perceive as a failure, he doesn't see it as a failure. He's like, you did a great job. You tried your best, you know? And mm. so in the moments of disappointment or just internal struggle, when you're, when you're trying to, you know, decipher what God's saying or work something out, um, just staying plugged into him and getting his perspective I think is just, is just key. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to do anything I did if I didn't know, you know, what God thinks about, about me. Yeah. So good. So good. Back to the secret place. (laughs) Really. (laughs) That's awesome. All right. How can we stay connected with you? Do you have a website, social media? Is there a way we can connect with you? Um, I don't, I'm not a big, like, I don't, I don't have like a social media page for the outreaches stuff that we're doing unless people wanted to plug into them. Um, I don't know, I guess they could follow me on like Instagram or, you know, Facebook friend me, but I'm not a big, like, you know, social media person per se. (laughs) Yep. Totally understand. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. I'm barely a millennial over here. (laughs) (laughs) not a bad place to be um again that we have naomi volkman with us and that's v-o-l-k-m-a-n if you want to connect with her on facebook instagram social media and even if it takes her a couple days to get back with us that's okay we'll give her grace (laughs) (laughs) Well, it has been so awesome to get to hear your story and your journey and how God just really intersected in the middle of um, such darkness, really, and such pain. I'd like to pray with you before we go today. Would that be okay? Oh, absolutely. Okay. And Father, I thank you so much for Naomi, God. I thank you for her life and her testimony. And Lord, we know that everything that she's overcome in her life, she now has keys to overcome in others. And one of the things I heard her say was the overcoming of suicide, which happens to be so close to my heart as a therapist. And what I see over her is that she's a world changer. And so often, and I tell my clients this, but so often the enemy really comes after world changers with the opposite of that, which is death. 
and suicide and all of those things. And so God, I thank you for saving her, Lord, for reaching out in the midst of that, God. I thank you, Lord, that uh, her voice is strong and her voice is anointed to break chains. And so I pray over her, Lord. I pray, God, that the, the huge nuts that you've given her would overflow. And I pray, God, that as you extend her tent pegs, Lord, that she would stay close to the heartbeat of you, that she would hear the rhythm of your heartbeat and just literally feel your cheeks brush against hers as she presses into you, that you Mm. fill her with greater joy because we know it's the joy of the Lord. That's our strength. We bless her. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming on. And that is it for this edition of Are You Real Linked? I want to remind you to connect with all of our hosts, Jody Holland, Are You Real Success? Dub Alexander, Are You Real Government? And you can find them at areyoureal.org. Until we meet again, remember to rest in his love dance with great joy, and aspire to go higher each day. This is your host, Christy Austin of Are You Real Linked? Have a great day. We'd like to thank you for joining us on this episode of Are You Real Linked? And encourage you to visit areyoureal.org for more resources based on today's episode, as well as links to more Christian podcasts in our network and the inspiration to help you enkindle everyone around you. God bless and good day.